This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. And this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have a wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous guest this evening, and that's saying something considering that um, she was fighting against one of the ugliest people in movies. (laughs) She was there to beautify it, though. We have our first, this is, this is a milestone for me in many ways, folks, because this is my 50th interview since um, April of 2015, um, the podcasting, wow, and uh, my 50th interview, this is my first on Skype, just got on the Skype scene here, and my first from the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, I've had a lot of the Friday the 13th ones on here. My first from the Nightmare on Elm Street, and it is the gorgeous, beautiful Lisa Wilcox. How you doing, Lisa? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? And what an absolutely lovely introduction. My goodness, I'm blushing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm in the presence of beauty. I got, I got a compliment. <laughs> wow. Yeah, um, I'm four hours ahead of you. Okay, so uh, it's uh, four hours, so it's definitely evening there, and I'm enjoying a a lovely 4 p.m. afternoon. (laughs) And and you know what? I I love doing the L.A. interviews because um, it uh, it means I can get done my day job, and I can come here, and I can do these. Oh, got it. Yes, very good. Yes. But I, I have done a lot of interviews, and um, I've been reviewing movies since 1996, and I've been here at the station here since uh, 2005. And uh, But wow. I just started podcasting, like I said, April of 2015 when you know, I, I landed my first interview, and, and here we are. And um, i got to say, I'm, I'm excited about it. I've, um, every, every, I've never had a bad interview uh, and I'm still very much connected with a lot of the people I've interviewed. I'm I'm very happy. Oh, that's fantastic! Cool. Yeah. So you've been doing radio a long time. I had no idea. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I have. I've always had love for movies. You know, like um, I'm 44 years old, so I um. I've always been in love with the movies. We don't have drive-in theaters here anymore, but my parents used to take my brothers and I to the drive-in. Oh, yes. I remember the drive-ins. I know there's only a few scattered about uh, the United States anymore, but uh, weren't those fun? Sitting, eating popcorn in the car, in the convertible, hopefully. <laughs> well, it, it's funny because we just had the, the reboot of Pete's Dragon out, and I was reminded that the first drive-in movie I saw at five years old was the original oh. Pete's Dragon. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. And we saw like so the, you, uh-huh. So you did, you saw the remake? Yeah, and I actually liked it. Yeah, cool. I haven't seen it yet. I, I gotta say, it was actually a great. Um, for, it's, technically, it's not a remake because it doesn't follow the same story, and they did. A oh, great it doesn't. Job. Okay. Yeah, they actually did a worthy job on it. I was impressed. Neat. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. But uh, I remember at the drive-in, saw the Star Wars trilogy there, you know, and Raiders of the Lost mm-hmm. Ark and E.T. and all those movies. And some, even some of the old Disney classics because they used to do those retrospectives, you know. Mm, yes, yes, yes. I love the Disney movies. That's pretty much all the mo- the only movies I probably saw in any the theater growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember, though, my first R-rated movie. <laughs> Oh, it was with Burt Reynolds and Sally Field, and I can't think of the name. Was and, it uh, Smokey and the Bandit? It may have been Smokey and the Bandit, but there was nudity in it. Oh, it wouldn't and have been that. wouldn't have been that. Um, when they're making out, oh gosh, now I'm going to have to think of it by the end of the show. Um, but my parents took us, and, and we were still not quite at the R-rated age. <laughs> I just remember my parents squirming in their seat. <laughs> it was really funny. You know what's interesting? Uh, I've had a lot of the Friday the Thirteenth alumni on here, and I I know that I saw Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven: The New Blood at the theater here. My older brother yeah. and I. My older brother was seventeen, and I was fifteen. How we got in the theater to see that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. 
the so. memories of childhood. <laughs> <laughs> of get, getting into the theaters <laughs> yeah yeah but um do you know where i'm located here in the new uh new brunswick canada um yeah some somewhat how how far are we you away from like calgary oh we're i think we're across the way i think um you know where uh -huh. Hal, or you know where halifax nova scotia is yes i sure do yeah. i have a a good friend that filmed a, a movie there not too long ago what movie? Um, it was Julian Magnat is his name, and it had um, oh, what's with my brain? I will I will think of it. I will think of it. Um, really great film. Oh, Faces in the Crowd. It's called Faces in the Crowd. Terrific ne film. Never heard of that, but I do know that Hobo with a Shotgun was shot up here. Okay. Yeah, that was shot up here, and of course we got the Trailer Park Boys in Halifax. Are you familiar with them? No, I, the trailer who? The trailer park boys. Oh, I've heard of it. I've heard of it, but I haven't watched haven't watched it. Well, they're on their 11th season and they've done 3 movies and it was Ivan Reitman that produced their first movie. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, they're very funny and uh, I recommend them highly. <laughs> I will to I'm writing it down. I'm writing it down. Putting it on my list. Yep, trailer park boys. Basically, they're three stoners. <laughs> Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. I'm sure I've seen a trailer or something. Yeah, it's very funny. I always, I mention them in my, because um, not a lot of people know where we are here. I'm, I'm from Fredericton, New Brunswick. There's like three big cities here in New Brunswick, Fred Fredericton, St. John, and Moncton. And so I, I, when I get somebody on here, I always ask them, you know, do you know where we are? Because I never see movies, you know, what mention, <laughs> mention us. It's like, we, we're lucky to get bands come touring through here, you know? <laughs> Oh gosh! Oh gosh! So you're kind of in the boonies, is that what you're saying? Kind of like that. Now Moncton okay. um, does get some bands and stuff like that, you know. Um, but uh, so so I, I feel like I'm talking to royalty when I get do these podcast interviews. Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. Yeah, but um, thank you. Yeah, but but I'll tell you. Um, I, like I said, I've been doing this for, for a while, and uh, I grew up with a lot of these horror films. I, um, I remember when I was young, I was really scared of horror films, and I had cousins mm -hmm. I had cousins and an older brother that would kind of bait me into watching them, and I was scared to death of them. And I, I just recently um, found a, a horror film. I found it online, actually, accidentally. That scared mm -hmm. me when I was young, didn't scare me now, and I think it was... Uh, mm -hmm. Horror High, I think it was from the 19th, okay, <laughs> yeah, from the, from the 1970s, oh. yeah, from the 1970s, and I was like, does it scare me now? You know, but yeah, yeah, I, I find I think a lot of folks either totally dig horror or they just absolutely ref can't watch it at all. I mean, the, with my friends, um, I mean, I have some friends who who dig horror and others who have, will just never see me, my movies. They just won't. <laughs> <laughs> they just can't do it. Wow. Well, you know, it's gotten what happened with me. Like, like I said, I had cousin sets and, uh, and an older brother that just they would bait me into it, and I and I'd end up watching them because I'd want to see the bad guy get his uh, just desserts. And I remember they baited me into watching Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, and it was the first time I had seen a naked woman. And I would have oh been, my goodness. Yeah, that was when my mother came and rushed in and turned the television off. Not, <laughs> not, She's being a good mother. <laughs> well, she didn't turn it off during any of the three or four kills that happened beforehand. It was the nudes. And if I ever talk, if I ever talk, to, if I ever contact Kirsten Baker, I'm gonna enjoy telling her that she's the first naked woman I ever seen. Oh gosh, that'd be a hoot. <laughs> that would be that would be a hoot. But. Um, <laughs> But I remember, you know, when uh, Jason met his so-called end at the end of the film, and then he ends up being one of those mock endings where he ends up surviving, and I was like, why did I end up being baited to sit through it? And I remember going home from my cousins, my grandparents, and I was like, ah, oh, he's still out there, he's still out there, he's still alive, he came through the window. <laughs> and what had happened that my, bro my brother ended up convincing me to watch Friday the 13th, the final chapter, where Jason got killed. And I was satisfied with that, and I was able to sit through it, strangely enough. And um, 
it's funny because then they did the new beginning and Jason lives and, and it's gotten to the point now where like where like John Carpenter's Halloween's one of my all time favorite movies and I had like a nightmare in Elm Street and I just had Terry McMinn on from Texas Chainsaw Massacre and and mm -hmm. you know I like you know the, some of the Dario Argento films and Exorcist and the Hitchcock movies and I'm kind of like you know I kind of see it more as an art form now. <laughs> Yes, it truly will be. Yay, good. You've graduated. I've graduated. <laughs> graduated out of your fear into appreciating the art of, of horror films because it truly is an art. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to tell you, we've had some pretty decent horror films come out in 2016. Like, I just saw mm -hmm. Don't Breathe, and that was really good. Oh, was it? Ooh, okay. I'm writing another one down. I need to get out of the house. I've been watching, catching up on so many. Um, Horror films from like the 70s and 80s, 90s, etc. Just because um, it's interesting, I'm I've been uh, I'm back to acting again, so it's kind of like a reintroduction. And and the industry's changed so much now with the podcasts and the radio interviews and so many and even you know hard copy magazines, but they're also online. And uh, been doing quite a few of them, and I'm realizing I kind of have to become more of a professor, you know, <laughs> on the questions that I get asked about horror. So I'm. I'm in my own education process as well. So, what are some of your favorite horror films? Well, you know, I hate to be cliche, but I can't help it. Is you know, I love The Exorcist. In fact, I'm going to be watching um, the director's cut uh, uh, this week. Uh, my friend has the disc, and and also have started watching the commentaries. Are really interesting for me. I just wanted to watch the film because I want to stay in that audience fantasy land, you know. But the commentaries are fascinating, especially the ones where the director will talk you through the whole movie and what happened in each scene and what kind of, um, you know, hurdles they had or uh, all kinds of interesting um, background background things. So, so anyway, to answer your question, probably The Exorcist. I love The Omen as well. I am any kind of Dracula film love love them i had um i just i was fascinated with bella lugosi in fact in in college um i went to ucla and in the first year i was in the dorms and in the dorms you have a roommate you know of course these days i hear you have two roommates but in those days you had one roommate so you have your one side of the room and she has the other side of the room and i had a huge giant black and white poster of bella lugosi and, of course, my roommate had, like, I don't know, the Bee Gees or something like that, some music group, <laughs> on her side of the wall. So I've always been drawn to horror, no question. It's interesting, too. Because I love commentary tracks, too. And, of course, for The Exorcist, William Franken is so clear and well-spoken. Uh, mm. And he does a different commentary track on both. He does a different one on the original cut and does a different one on the uncut. So there's Oh, gosh. Yeah, so there's actually two different commentary tracks by him one on each my goodness how okay well i'll have to look that one up and check it out but it's interesting you bring up the exorcist because i've actually seen that five times in theaters oh oh wow yeah i um i would have been one years old when that movie originally came out in 1973 but mm -hmm. uh, i remember when um the last time i seen it in the theater it was the director's cut and and people in the theater were laughing and giggling when Linda Blair was in her high in the doctor's office in one of those cut scenes. A uh, nervous laughter, it must have been. <laughs> no, they were chuckling at her because of some of the oh, noises. Gosh. But the scene, like, where there was, uh, she was getting the needle. You could, I could see a girl sitting with her boyfriend, and she had her hands up over her face. And, <laughs> and the spider walk sequence just freaked them out. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's so creepy. Well, when it came out, I was in grade school, and we were two, and, but it was the rage. I mean, everyone at school was talking about it, and there's one boy, I remember, his name was Keith, and he got his parents, let him see it. So we clamored around him, tell us all the details, tell us about it, you know. So um, I finally think saw it when I was um, probably 16 or something. Um, wow, phenomenal. And I like The Omen as well, you know. I thought that was terrific. Gregory Peck, yeah. terrific in it. Yeah, very and good. 
And, but before you did the, you, you of course, was in uh, the night, a Nightmare on Elm Street 4 Dream uh, Master and uh, right. Nightmare on Elm Street 5 Dream, uh, um, Dream Child. Yeah. And, yep. But before you did that, I was looking at your credits. You did, uh, I think, a film called Give Me an F. Yes. Now, I noticed Jennifer Cook was in that. Of course, she went on to do Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, which I actually landed three interviews from within the last couple of months. Oh, gosh. I didn't get She Jen- was in Gimme an F, Jennifer Cook? Yeah. I, I noticed oh, she was my in. Gosh, I wonder what part she played, you know? I don't know. I've never seen the film, but I just looking at your credits and on Wikipedia and I was like, oh, Jennifer, is that the same Jennifer Cook? And I clicked the name and yeah, yeah, Jason lives on as one of her credits. So I'm like, oh. That is funny. Now I'm gonna have to look up um look up Gimme an F and see what she played in it. Um Gimme an F, I don't know if she talked about it, but it was an eighties film what they call T N A kind of 80s film and I actually took a quarter off of school to do this movie and the film was about four uh, well competing cheerleading groups you know at cheerleading camp so it was narrowed down to four of four groups and the group I was in we were called the demons kind of a foreshadowing perhaps to uh, my (laughs) Nightmare on Elm Street experience but we were like the bad girls we dressed in red and black and white we smoked cigarettes we cussed we were like little hot sexy chicks <laughs> troublemakers anyway it was pretty fun i didn't get to interview jennifer cook she was not one oh, of okay the, yeah um i don't even know she's even acting anymore but mm. but um the three people i know i spoke to from the movie they they haven't uh had much contact with her but they said good things about her from from doing jason lives but but um but you also, you know, did a, a film I noticed with Mark Hamill, aka Luke Skywalker. Heck yeah, yes I did, and I tell you, I was so nervous the first day of filming uh, because in this film we actually make out. I mean, we're lovers, and we we're on this track. And Watchers, by the way, um, that we did is the closest re- closest to the book, the Dean Kuntz, Kuntz book, Watchers. Uh, it's, it, it follows the storyline beautifully um, with the book because they had done three other Watcher films before Mark and I did um, the final Watchers. But that I'll tell you, yeah, I was so nervous that first day and we were on location and it was, of course, a scene where I had all this dialogue and where a lot of action. We're getting groceries out of the car and walking it into the cabin and this, that and the other. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, my God, it's Luke Skywalker. Oh, my gosh, because, of course, I'm a huge fan of the Star Wars fan franchise. So it was so exciting. Anyway, he's the most lovely man and just lovely, lovely. We hit it off great. We had a great time. Um, he's a huge fan of The Simpsons. So he would bring Simpsons episodes to set. And while we're waiting for you know lighting and they're setting up the scenes, we would sit in the trailer and we would watch Simpsons episodes together. So, so that was pretty fun. So when you um, had, when you made out with them, did Princess Leia get upset? When what? <laughs> did Princess Leia get angry when you made out with them? <laughs> no, <laughs> she was barred from set. She couldn't come that day. <laughs> so yeah, but he he also um he was kind enough. He invited me and um my kids and and whatnot to his house and swam in his pool and hung out on the patio and a rather funny incident happened um my my two boys were with me and we're sitting at the patio table after swimming and whatnot and we're just chatting with mark and his wife and and whatnot and they had a a bowl of cherries on the table and my youngest son ryan he was about mm, i'd say about three years old and he's eating the cherries and I, I, you know, was engaged in conversation, and I look over, and it looks like about half the cherry bowl is is gone. <laughs> then my son starts to get a little green, and he proceeds to, yes, vomit cherries all over Mark Hamill's patio. <laughs> And he was so cool because he also has, I think, at least, I think, three children. He's like, oh, no problem. This happens all the time. Uh-oh. And he proceeds to get the garden hose that's right there and start spraying the vomit off of the patio. Oh, 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 he could just, so, he anyway. Could, he could just get Chewbacca to roll over it. 
Yeah, right. I know we should have just made a phone call, right? <laughs> so it was pretty fun. Nice yeah. guy. Wow. You, you know what's interesting? One of the things I like about Mark Hamill is that he's he's you're, he's willing to engage with people about Star Wars, where unfortunately Alec Guinness had a big chip on his shoulder about it. Hmm. Which, hmm. Which yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't see Mark ever having a chip on his shoulder about anything, quite frankly. So, yeah, he's just a, a very warm-hearted, neat, neat guy. Well, what's interesting, too, you know, like – like he's able to make fun of himself. If you've seen Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, you know he's mm. yeah he's in that, and he actually gets his hand cut off. <laughs> and, no uh, way, I haven't seen it. Okay, I've got another to add to my list. Heavens to Betsy, I'm gonna have a long list. I think after the end of the interview, oh, yeah. <laughs> the things well, I need to see. You're familiar, oh gosh, that's cute. You're familiar with Kevin Smith. Yes, yes. Yeah, he made Jane Silent Bob Strikes Back, and it was kind of like a tie-in with his previous films, Clerks, Mall Rats, and Chasing Amy. Okay. And, and uh, I think Dogma. And um, he had some cameos in it. And, uh, Carrie Fisher makes a cameo appearance, and Mark Hamill makes a cameo appearance. And, oh, You know, and neat. it was kind of funny because you can see Mark Hamill is able to ham it up at the expense of his uh, Star Wars reputation. He, he, yeah, he d- doesn't seem to bother him. That's what I like. Nah, nah. I, no, I, I, I would imagine. Sorry. <coughs> I keep sneezing. I've got a little cold. So, sorry. Maybe Freddie knows we're going to talk about him and he's <laughs> trying to infect <laughs> right. you. Yeah, actually, maybe I'm in a dream. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> yeah, yeah, my tongue's going to come through the phone. <laughs> <laughs> through the Skype. Through Freddie's the Skype. tongue through Skype. On your computer screen. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, I got to ask, you know, after three movies and you had, you know, Heather Le- Leggenkamp headlining too, you came in to play Alice. And um, how, I was just wondering, how did you get the part as Alice? Well, gosh, I, I did it kind of the typical Hollywood way, which is um, – um, film groups, their cast has a casting director and the casting director – puts out um, a breakdown. It's called a breakdown. And it lists the characters that they're looking for. And then our agents or managers would submit pictures of us. And then the casting director goes through and selects who um, can come into their office and audition. So interesting enough, this is right after I graduated from UCLA. And (laughs) <laughs> it, about a year, let's see, when did I graduate from UCLA? It was about two years after I graduated from UCLA, and my manager submitted me for the role of Alice, and they wouldn't see me. Now, back then, too, I played uh, cheerleader roles. I did a role on Hardcastle McCormick, where I was uh, win the beauty pageant and that kind of thing. So that was my look, you know, the hair and the makeup and the whole thing. So, understandably, um, I didn't, it's not what they envisioned for the role of Alice. So, um, anyway, Annette Benson, who, who was the casting director for Nightmare on Elm Street 4, and she, she did a few of, a number of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies too. I'm, I'm pretty sure she did three, two, and maybe one as well. But anyway, she tells me the story of how they couldn't find Alice. They couldn't find the right actress. So they, after a month, they went through their reject pile, which I proudly was in, and I finally had an opportunity, the opportunity to audition for Alice. And so, of course, you know, I read the script and um, I completely got Alice like right away. And she was so much of me growing up. And I went in with, you know, no dirty hair and no makeup. And I wore my worst color, which is pale yellow, eh, unless I have a tan and I look okay in yellow. But <laughs> anyway, I auditioned and they called me back. Uh, to see my work again, and Rennie Harlan was in the uh, in the room Tuesday night. Had already been cast, and she was in the room as well as the um, the director photographer, and did my scene. And I remember the scene I did was actually with Tuesday. The scene um, in the um, at the high school when she's on, we're on the bench, and we're talking about the luggage under our eyes and the bags under our eyes and the dream master and, and she's smoking a cigarette and, and whatnot. So that's the scene. So anyway, so I did my call back on a Friday and I was getting married, huge wedding that Sunday. 
So I got married on Sunday on my honeymoon in Hawaii, and I got a call that I had booked the role of Alice. I'm just curious. The, the character's name is Alice. Was that、um, just accidental, or was it a reference to the Adrian King character from the original Friday the Thirteenth? Because her name was Alice as well. Oh yeah,、um, I liken it more towards Alice in Wonderland, and, and there's even a line, "Welcome to Wonderland, Alice." And because Alice has to, literally, she changes, you know, quite a bit. She has to go down that rabbit hole, and has to adapt to what's happening around her, with Freddy and her friends dying, and she's absorbing their personalities and their traits and this and that. So I, I liken it more towards Alice in Wonderland. Well, that makes sense. Lewis Carroll's, yeah, Lewis Carroll's Lewis,、um, Alice in Wonderland. And in fact, whenever、um, I was in Disney World. Uh, in January this year, and of course, you know they have all the characters where you can wait in line. You know, at certain times, you get picture taken with characters. So of course, I had to have my picture taken with Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe she had to have her picture taken with Lisa Wilcox. Oh, there you go. There you go. I'm gonna. So it's I'm pretty gonna, fun. I'm gonna flip that coin the other way. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, it's interesting because I wanted to introduce myself as. Hey, I'm Lisa Wilcox. I played Alice in Nightmare Four and Five, but the characters they can't talk to you. So her eyes, they, they she can. Let me put it this way: they talk to you, but they can only talk to you in character. As for her, Alice in Wonderland, she can't talk as herself, as you know the person that she is. So I say, I'm Lisa Wilcox, and she looks at me and and she's oh well, and she's doing the Alice. Voice, but I, I think I could tell from her eyes that she knew who I was, but she couldn't break character, you know. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> I've never been to Disney World, so I, I didn't know they couldn't do that. But <laughs> nope, they can't. They have to stay in character. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? Johnny Depp was in that first Elm Street, and he did play the Mad Hatter. So. <laughs> There you go, right? There you go. So it kind of it kind of、uh, weaves itself through、uh, Lewis Carroll's, you know, brilliant Alice in Wonderland weaves its through Nightmare on Elm Street, I would say. <laughs> And of course,、uh, Renny Harlan uh, directed uh, Dream Master. Now,、um, And I thought Johnny was great in in those two. I think he's great. Okay, yes, you were asking. Sorry. Yeah, Renny Renny Harlan, of course. Who has the unfortunate、uh, reputation of having directed、um, Cutthroat Island, which is, of course, known as one of the biggest box office bombs ever? And、mm-hmm. I don't know how bad that has hurt him, but well, you win some, you lose some, as they say. You know,、uh, I can't say that. I mean, I think he's a wonderful director. He was certainly a, such a pleasure to work with. He was just very calm and reassuring on set at all times, and he was. He was really an actor's director. He 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 wanted us to rehearse, and and he was very open to ideas that we had.、Uh, he he was great. Yeah, I think he's a really good director. I loved Die Hard, and、um, you know a lot a lot of the films he's done. Yeah, and then of course Stephen Hopkins directed Dream Master, and of course he went on to have a pretty successful career. Yeah, Dream、well. Child. Yeah,、oh, Dream Child. Dream okay, Child. yeah, yeah. Dream Child. Oh yeah, he had a very prolific、uh, career. Absolutely. What what were the similarities and differences between the two directors? Um, I would say Steve Hopkins was more of um he was an art he's an artist an amazing amazing artist he did all the storyboards, which are basically um drawn depictions of each scene in the movie, and so you have your storyboard so every scene has a, a, at least a few sheets with drawings and. And that's what Steven did because it helps you get an idea of what kind of POV you want to have in the scene,、um, uh, the angles, how wide of a shot, what shots you want to make sure you cover when you're doing each scene. So he drew these, and he was very much into the production value of the film. So he, I would say, he's more of a、um, aesthetic director, as, and the sets were very. very、um, He was very obsessed with the sets and and this, and I think Rennie was more about、um, more of an actor's director,、uh, but both wonderful in their in their own way. Well, before you did、um, Dream Master, had you、um, seen any of the previous films? Heck yeah,、okay. <laughs> absolutely. 
Uh, I was a fan of the Nightmare franchise, yes, before I did Alice, uh, for sure. I'd seen the first one. I'd seen all three. I had seen all three. I loved I loved number three. Well, I loved one, too. I mean, I liked all of them for the same reason. But, yes, I was quite thrilled to have the opportunity to finally audition for Nightmare on Elm Street and thrilled, of course, to get the role because I was already a fan. I've been a fan of horror since I was – since I could walk probably, so <laughs> – well, did did you know you were auditioning for an Elm Street film, or was it under a different name when you went in? Nope, I knew it was a Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Master. Yep, for sure. Oh, wow. Yeah. That that is really cool, and of course, you know uh, Robert Englund, of course, famous for playing Freddy Krueger. Mm-hmm. You have any interesting stories to share about him? Well, you know, he is just, he's so incredibly bright and intelligent, and he knows something about everything, from interior design to certainly film, actors. He has a memory like an elephant, seriously. It's amazing. And he's a very high-energy guy, and I'm telling you, that poor guy to sit in that chair with all that energy for four hours having that makeup put on, God bless him, you know? Um, and I know that was tough for him because he's not the kind of guy that, you know, sits, you know, but we had, um, you know, we just had a great time. There was, there's no, like, I wish I had some funny little story. I mean, I know there's a story at the beach, but I wasn't there when fans heard that he was filming at the beach and, and, uh, they were in their trailer and (laughs) like 300 fans surrounded the trailer and started shaking the trailer. Pretty crazy stuff. But with him and I, um, probably the most interesting thing is to get to work with him again on um, a a project called Fear Clinic. Okay. We did six webisodes. So I actually got to work with him out out of his makeup and a completely different character, Dr. Andover. So that was pretty amazing to, you know, have worked with him in the Nightmare series, but then have the opportunity to work with him again. It was pretty great. But he's great. He and his, his wife, Nancy, were all really good friends and of course, you know, we see each other and hang out um, when we do the autograph show circuit. So, When you do these conventions, do uh, you have any interesting, strange things that you get approached to sign? Um, well, I think the most interesting is signing somebody's skin because they're going to have a tattoo made um, of my signature. <laughs> I hear so. that a lot. Yeah, I mean, just recently I signed a woman's thigh with my name. So I'd say that's the most interesting thing. But what's so fun about doing the shows is that at almost every show, someone brings something to the table to sign that I've never even seen before, whether it's a, I don't know, a Blu-ray disc from China or or a, some poster from Thailand or um props and all kinds of interesting things so i have so much fun just um enjoying all these interesting things out there um from all over the world you know so it's it's pretty cool and then and then i asked them can i take your picture with this item (laughs) and people have built things like built the the nightmare elm street house with the red door and um just such creativity uh, recently there was a guy, a kid brought a pizza that had this underneath, it had a tube and this little thing you'd squeeze with air and it made the meatballs on the pizza animated because they filled up with air. It was phenomenal. And that was the first time I'd ever seen, seen something like that. Oh, oh gee, the creativity that goes into the, I don't know why mm-hmm. they don't make movies about that. Because I remember in 1996, there was a film that I boycotted called The Fan. And it, mm-hmm. of course, starred Robert De Niro as an obsessive fan of a baseball player played by Wesley Snipes. And I think mm-hmm. ever, ever since John Lennon was shot, you know, it's like fans get blamed for every nitpick and uh, hairy thing that that uh, happens to some of these celebrities. And I get that it happens, mm-hmm. but but they, they focus on that. And they never focus on the really good and positive thing that fans do like some of the creativities like i just interviewed deborah shelton back in um may and i contacted Mm -hmm. her through her fan fan page and her fan page was operated by one of her fans from canada Uh, offering to do what well one of her fans from canada operates her web page 
Oh yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. And I yeah. thought that was really cool, you know, and, um, yeah. but you never hear stuff like that highlighted and you mentioned the pizza and whatnot. And I find that sometimes, um, um, especially some of the bigger stars and bigger authorities in Hollywood, they never really, um, pay much attention to this kind of detail. But uh, well, all I can say is all of the fans and supporters, I, I have all just been phenomenal and, and I never had any kind of scary experience whatsoever. Everyone's been just so wonderful and again, supportive of just not Nightmare on Elm Street, but the other work that I've done as well and supportive of me coming back into the, um, into the, into the industry full force and, Gosh, yeah. I mean, I have had a fan who redid my Facebook, and um, absolutely. I mean, they're they're wonderful. And if, any, if any of you guys are out there listening, I just want to say thank you so much for your support. Uh, I just had um, an Alice uh, an Alice lives. It's it's a lapel pin that I designed and had produced, and I'm giving them away at shows if you get an autograph. But I'm giving those away, and they're also um, supportive of that. Also, I'm would like um this was so cool in Louisville, Kentucky, Days of the Dead. Uh, this young man, Troy, came up to my table and he said, "You know, why is there no Alice action figure?" And I had I'm like, "I don't know." He's like, "There needs to be an action figure." And he, in fact, he's like, "He's like Amanda Wish should have an action figure," and uh, on and on. So he brought um, me a notepad to start collecting names and emails from people to like a petition. He's like, "You need a petition." For an action figure. So apparently there's a, a company that does the, the best of the best action figures. So so he started that for me. And so, in fact, now on my uh, my website, Lisa E. Wilcox, you can sign the petition. So hopefully, maybe in the year, a year to come, there'll be an Alice action figure. Wouldn't that be cool? Wow. But that all started with um, a fan, you oh, know? that's terrific. Yeah, it got me thinking. That was awesome. You say Amanda Wiz has one? No, that she doesn't, and oh. that she needs one, okay. and that's what he was saying too. So he gave her a notebook too to start collecting names and addresses, names and emails, you know. So we'll see. Maybe he. Uh, so thank you, Troy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Troy <laughs> and I already well. did thank him on, um, I think Facebook. So. Oh, perfect. Well, you got a nice shout out here on the podcast. So there we go. Yay! <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, you you mentioned to me that you're good friends with Amanda Wiz. Mm-hmm. What's Amanda yep. like? Oh gosh, she's if you ever meet her at a show, she's just super down to earth and and just she's so much fun. Oh, we have the best time. We 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 go hiking together and go to lunch and and things like that. But yeah, she's she's awesome. And Heather too. Um, you know, we're all good friends. There's so many um, you know, Andras Jones who plays Rick in Nightmare 4, he's actually my manager now. Okay. He work he's at Bohemia uh management group. Uh, Brooke Thies, who, you know, played Debbie, turns into the cockroach in Nightmare 4. She and I are great friends and see her, see each other. Our, uh, she has a son and my eldest, they're the same age. So we would go bowling together and, and that kind of thing. Tuesday Night, who played Kristen in Nightmare 4, of course. Um, she and I had a business together for eight years. And so it's just very interesting because most often – when you do a play or you do a TV show or you do a film, you work with these people for whether eight days or two months and you never see them again. You never, ever see them again. But it's been a completely different experience with Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, oh, even Toy Newkirk, who plays Sheila, she dies of asthma. She lived in New York for a while and then she came back to L.A. and she lived with me for a year. You know, so it's just very – It we really are um, – have a lot of respect for each other and we genuinely, genuinely – like each other, you know, so, love each other. So, so, so is Brooke into the ex, uh, insect extermination business now? <laughs> no, but she has an action figure. Darn it! <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to uh, say uh, uh, Amanda was. I've been trying to get her on here for almost two years, and uh, uh, what had happened? I'm going to tell you about the first time I've made um, contact with her on Twitter. I uh, started following her on Twitter, and she went on there, and she posted a comment. And if I get her on here, I'm going to mention this to her. Um, mm. uh, she said, and I'm me being a smartass responded to this. She put, allergies, 
Ah, and I've been a smart ass, but to Freddy Krueger, <laughs> she responded. Yeah. She responded, but ha ha, funny. <laughs> <laughs> But well, I'll tell her I did an interview with you. Well, I sent her a, a thing. It's hard to get people on Twitter with 140 characters. I have done it. In fact, I actually got Alfred Hitchcock's granddaughter on here, of all people. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was amazing. Because Hitchcock, Hitchcock got me into film studies, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, and to get his granddaughter on here, and I got her through Twitter, and I could not believe I was talking to the granddaughter of the great Alfred Hitchcock. Oh, but, that's neat. But I sent a request out there for Amanda, and I told her to follow me so that I could give her a detailed private message, and she followed me. Oh, and, good. But um, I think I might be able to get her through Tommy Hudson. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. they're making a movie called The ID, and um, I've been in contact with Tommy, and um, he's looking to get uh, he and Amanda both hopefully on in October. Oh, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I saw it. I saw the film. Oh, she's brilliant. I mean, amazing. Creepy, creepy film. Oh, my gosh. It's so good. It is so good. They had a screening at um, Rally Studios a few months ago. And, oh, well, boy, Amanda just rips it up. Boy, is she a good actress. And I've been a fan of hers a long time, like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, one of my all-time yeah. favorite movies. I'm going to tell you, as funny as Sean Penn is in that movie, it's, mm-hmm. hard, it's hard for me to pay attention to him when he's got that beautiful, gorgeous blonde smiling behind him in that classroom. Yeah, that's so cute. That's so cute. That's adorable. Yeah, yep. she's, she's, she's great. Yep, so um, I'm looking forward to have, having her on here. And Tommy Hudson, of course, was the guy who made those uh, really great um, Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street uh, packages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street one documentary, yeah, and Tommy, love Tommy. He's so creative and incredibly smart and just a lovely, lovely man. But, yeah, that documentary, when when he gave me my copy – uh, I, I was like, thanks, 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 thanks. So it was about 10 o'clock at night one evening, and I'm like, well, you know, let me just pop it in. Let me check this out. <laughs> Four hours later, two in the morning, it I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It was so fascinating. I, I learned so much about the series, and he did a phenomenal job. How he found these people underneath the rock, under, seriously, he uncovered so many of the actors from – the, all the movies. I, I mean, over a hundred interviews. It was just fascinating. So hats off to Tommy. He did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Yeah. Yep. So I've, I've actually heard from him. I think, uh, I don't know, was it this week or at least a few days ago I heard from him, and he suggested mid-October or something that would be good for him and Amanda both. And I was like, good, kill two birds with one stone, get them both. Yeah, that would be a great interview. Oh, that will be fun. So, yeah, I, yeah, always liked Amanda and looking forward to having her on. And uh, but and I've reached out to Heather Leggenkamp, but I noticed she had um, – um, a link that kind of had Tommy Hutton's name on it. And I'm like, does he represent her too? Uh, yeah, I think for conventions. Yeah, he books for conventions. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and Tommy used to book mine too, but he's gotten so busy with his own projects that um, that I'm, I'm now with um, Robert England's booking agent. But uh, but yeah, Tommy Tommy was doing the managing the conventions and getting us to the shows. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, but he's not doing that so much. I think he just does it for Heather now. But because again, he's doing his own stuff too, writing, et cetera. Well, I'll tell you, he did a phenomenal job on those documentaries. I mean, kudos to him. You know, like fantastic yeah. work. Yeah. So, yeah. Definitely. But uh, you worked with some other interesting people in this. Uh, of course, uh, Dream Master, of course, opens with uh, the the survivors of Dream Warriors. Yes. And, um, boy, they, they don't have an easy open. <laughs> I know, right? It's like, hi, bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like um, you just can't keep Freddy down. You think he's gone, and you're like, yep. it's, like, it's like Heather's Nancy is rolling in her grave thinking, jeepers, why? What did I die yeah. for? <laughs> well, they, they just you had to keep doing another one, do another one, do another one. 
Yep. Which is great. Yeah, but uh, I know you worked with uh, Danny Hassel, who played, of course, Dan, and you worked with him in both films, and I guess he doesn't look at a motorcycle the same anymore. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, those special effects were amazing, amazing. Out of all the special effects in the the Elm Street, two Elm Streets you did, which one... um, uh, what word am I looking for? It impressed you the most? Were you on set for any of those? Oh yeah. Uh, well, I was on set like every single day. Um, so I got to see the making of how they did a lot of these effects. I think that the cockroach one was absolutely fabulous, and her arms and oh my god, it still holds up today. I think as far as the the look of it, it just is amazing. And it wasn't CGI. There's no CGI, you know, no. that didn't exist back then. So I, I think Debbie, yeah, the cockroach was really marvelous. I also think that um, in Nightmare 5, I think it was, anyway, they had the giant Freddy and, and um, or was it in 4? And they have, there's a shot where you see the bodies trying to get out of Freddy right? Yeah. And those are, you know, regular size human people trying to get out of Freddy. And what they did, they built this 10 foot Freddy to put people in to do that shot. So, you know, on set, there's this 10 foot Freddy thing (laughs) on the set. uh, I have a picture. uh, My mom came to just on set one day and I have a picture of mom and I next to the giant Freddy. And we look like these tiny little people next to this huge Freddy. So I thought that was a cool effect as well. Wow. I'm going to tell you one that stood out to me that I remember really well was, and uh, I think it was uh, Dream Child. It's been a while since I've seen these. So uh, uh, Dream Child, I think it was, the guy with the comic book. Yes, yes. It's sucked into the comic book. Yeah, I really thought neat. that was really cool. Was you there yeah. for any of that? Oh, yeah. I was, yep, I was there. For that and um, yeah, how they did that exactly. I just remember r- drawing the house. That there's a scene where I have to go into his dream world, so I draw I think a house and a stick figure, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then I mysteriously end up in his dream, you know. But I was around for that. Also, the sets that Stephen Hopkins developed were massive, just absolutely massive. Like in the final scene, and uh, well, the final death of Freddy with Amanda Kruger coming in and it was amazing. And then there's this Escher, an Escher set um, that Steve Hopkins also developed. And that was amazing. And again, these huge, huge sets, you, you'd walk on and you felt like you're on another planet. Yeah. And it's very, very impressive. And it's interesting because I'm looking through the names here. Um, Brooke Bundy. It's, it's funny because I just had, Tiffany Helm on here from Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning. And she mm. had mentioned that Brooke Bundy is her mom. Oh, no way. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, t- Brooke, t- Brooke Bundy's uh, great, too. She's an awesome lady. Yeah, I did not know. Tiffany was the girl with the, the punk rockish hair and uh, A New Beginning. And uh, she had mm-hmm. mentioned that that, uh, that Brooke Bundy. Of course, um, Tiffany was also in the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street TV show where she gave birth to, to, to Freddy. And, uh, but she said Brooke Bundy mm. played uh, her mom, who I guess has a Facebook page, but she, she, she did, didn't know she had a Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, how fun. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so uh, what was Brooke Bundy like? Oh, great. Lovely, lovely. I see her at shows as well. No, she's, she's just terrific 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 yeah wonderful lady there's really not a bad one in the bunch just there isn't everyone is just open and lovely i mean in the nightmare at elm street crowd uh and i think and a lot of supporters too say you know what nightmare at elm street people are really cool they're like down to earth and i'm like yeah hell yeah <laughs> so yeah she's lovely and she did soaps didn't brooke bundy do soaps in the beginning i did soaps too but yeah well, she I, was big on. I think she. I thought she was really big on the soaps, the big character on soap operas. But I don't know. I'm not sure. She, you might be right there. Early, early in her career, yeah. And of course, I love that name Tuesday Night. How creative is that? Yes. Well, her father was a songwriter, so there you go. 
Well, you know, um, it's interesting because you, you mentioned that you two was in business. You guys, what, what was it, uh, footwear or sneakers you guys were selling? No, no, it was called Toe Brights. And we made Illusion Band, which is a clear, stretchy band with a charm on it uh, covered with Swarovski crystals. So we had, oh my gosh, over 200 different designs from flowers to mermaids, palm trees, oh gosh, puppy dogs, cats, all kinds of charms that, um, and Tuesday did the majority absolutely of the design work and color choices. And we actually started this from home. She was making these and we bumped into each other at a Staples office supply and we talked for like an hour and a half and she showed me these these pieces that she was making I was like oh my gosh I love them they're so adorable so I actually invested money we started our company we incorporated and we started our business and we were working from our uh, our homes and then uh, we were getting orders and so we hired our girlfriends and taught them how to make them and we give them the supplies they need like a dowel and a and um, a vice to hold the dowel and this glue and the stones and this and that. And I came up with this system like a BFG 4814 would be a butterfly gold base with uh, the, you know, a purple stone size 0. 0.6 and et cetera. So, so you know, a, a language so that they knew how to make them from their home. So, so this crazy thing we're doing from home. Then we got a huge account, Long's Drugstore which is like a CVS. Uh, Long's is no longer around, but it, it's a big drug, drug store chain, at least in California. And we're like, oh my gosh, how are we going to fill this order? Well, we actually ended up getting a third partner who actually had a factory in uh, just in Los Angeles um, and office space downtown. <clears throat> so we actually <clears throat> got to move out of our homes and have an office to go to every day. And ultimately, we were selling internationally. We had a huge, huge account in Japan. I went there a couple times to do uh, openings, and and they were selling out in the Japan department stores. Did shopping channel um, in Japan. So what what an experience we had! What an experience! And eventually, we went on to do more than just toe rings. We did anklets and necklaces and bracelets and sunglasses, and we did a whole 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 bunch of stuff too. So, and I did all the conventions, not autograph show conventions, but conventions like gift show conventions and fashion, co fashion conventions all over the country and um, a few in uh, the UK as well. So what a, what a great ride that was we had. It's strange. I don't know where I got sneakers from. I, I, maybe I'm thinking about something else, but, I, I mm. knew, but uh, are you, you two still doing this? No, no, we, we, and we, it went about eight years, nine years it went, you know, but eventually we, we did close shop. It was too much, too much inventory and other things. I look back and I'm like, if we just stayed with the toe rings and the anklets. I think we'd still probably be doing it, but we, um, but you know what we had, we were, it was very successful. It was very successful, but we had, unfortunately we were embezzled by a bookkeeper and oh my gosh, crazy stuff happened. Just crazy stuff. Oh, so that's... it's really um, was a shame, you know, to ha I don't know, they stole like $150,000. <laughs> it's just crazy. And this gal, we did go to jail, actually. So anyway, that, that in its own is its own story, I tell you. Well, I know what it's like to have people steal from me. Uh, so, well, I, 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 I've, I've, uh, I know a guy I helped save his business, and yeah. it's five grand I'll never see again. Uh, I was supposed to get it fired. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it destroyed our friendship. Sure. Yep. Sure. And I've yeah. Had, I've had sorry, people. sorry about that, but yeah, all kinds of things happen in business. I tell you. Yep. But um, no, not not fun at all. But uh, I thought you were kind of on a roll. I sat in there thinking to myself, "Gee, it, she sounds so successful." At this. I was like, "What yeah. happened?" But I well, guess. who knows? Who knows? Maybe we'll do it again. Um, I every at every show, people ask about it, um, especially the the girls. You know, the women do. Um, and Tuesday night, kind of, we, we kind of broached the subject. So I don't know. You never know. I'm going to be seeing her soon, so I might broach the subject again. You gonna see her on Wednesday night? <laughs> <laughs> no, we only see each other on Tuesday night. <laughs> only Tuesday night. You gotta, you gotta make it. <laughs> wow. No. Um, 
Yeah, I remember Tuesday night in the movie, and of course, uh, uh, Rodney Eastman. Any stories about him? Oh gosh, Rodney! I adore Rodney. He, again, very articulate, smart guy. I had the biggest crush on him when I watched Nightmare in Three, Nightmare Three in the eighties. I thought he was so cute. I was like, oh my god, that Rodney Eastman. So, um, but we we always ha have this debate about which was more successful box office wise, Nightmare 3 or Nightmare 4. I keep saying Nightmare 4 was, and he insists Nightmare 3 was more successful box office wise. Anyway, we always have this debate, but no, we love each other. <laughs> I think it was Nightmare 4, but I could be wrong. No, nope, yes, it's Nightmare 4, but he just refuses to believe it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 no. When you include international, it's Nightmare Three. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> well, that, he he might have a point. Who knows? I'm just going domestically here, but he. May well, have one a day point. I'm really like, no. I, I don't know. I keep hearing it's Nightmare Four. At least that's what my research has shown. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I find it funny because a lot of films don't get international release. Like I mentioned, for instance, earlier the Trailer Park Boys movies. Like, um, like I know that there's some people in my interview that I've interviewed that have heard of them, and I always mention them because they're closest to us here. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I know Ivan Reitman produced their first movie, but I don't know how popular they are internationally. But I know that mm -hmm. in, I know that in Texas they're popular, and and you know New York and up and up in that area. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Uh, but internationally, you know, that's a whole whole other thing. Like we've had films released in Canada that mm -hmm. I thought were great movies that did not get released in the States, like films like Hyena Road, directed by Paul Gross. That was, mm -hmm. I think that was better than American Sniper. Really? Okay. Wow. No, I don't know it. I don't know it. Mm -mm. And uh, Uva, I had Uva Bull on here um, a year ago in September, and uh, he mentioned the movie Captive, starring Ryan Reynolds, that was shot here in Canada by the director of The Sweet Hereafter, he said mm -hmm. he, he said he watched that over prisoners any day. No kidding! Wow. Well, I don't know. It's I don't know how that distribution works exactly, but and so many movies too that are made just go straight to DVD. I mean, Bill Moseley, even uh, uh, Danny Trejo. Um, when I'm watching a film and they show previews, you know, before I watch the movie on DVD or whatever, I'm like. I never saw that. I didn't know Danny was in that. That was never released. And it is straight to DVD. So it, it doesn't kind of, you know, it, you could have a name and still your film is going to go straight to DVD, you know? So it happens a lot more than you think. And it doesn't make any sense. Like the ID, but the Amanda Wiz is, is going to be in, like, we're probably not going to get it here. Mm hmm You know? But that's okay because I'm willing to help them promote it regardless because this podcast yeah. will be heard outside yeah. the city. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah. Know? But there, but when you do some digging, you can find stuff. You know, you can find it and stream it online or whatever. So, but there's so many films, right, that don't get the proper light of day, as it were. You know, so. You know what's interesting? Um, this year was a record breaker for me because I saw a film nine times in theater this year, and it, there was a film that uh, only made three million domestically at the box office, but I'm predicting it's going to have a cult following. And it was a oh. little, it was a little movie called Everybody Wants Some. Okay. I loved it. It was from Richard Rink Linkletter, and it was a spiritual sequel of sorts for Dazed and Confused. Hmm. And it's and you know how Dazed and Confused is set in the seventies. Everybody Wants Some is set in 1980 and that weekend before college starts. Mm -hmm. And not only did I love the characters, the quirky characters, I felt like I was spending uh, um, a long weekend with all these interesting characters. But the, yeah. sound, but the soundtrack, I ordered it off Amazon because I still do buy CDs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I, I, Good for I, you. I do too. Heck yeah. Yeah. But I ordered the soundtrack, and the music just took me back. Mm. And uh, kind of like that Rock of Ages effect, it did the same thing, you know. Music it mm -hmm. just took me back to the childhood. And, and I went mm -hmm. to Everybody Wants Some nine times, and there's big blockbusters I might have seen once, but they never got me a theater nine times. Yeah, wow. Mm. Well, good for you. And we only, good, cool. 
and we only had that film for two weeks. So I don't understand wow. audiences sometimes, you know, but I do I know. know. Yeah. yeah, I do. I know. Well, it's people like you that will help create that cult following that that project needs. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. And some, of course, um, people that I interview, they get to talk about the various films they were in and hopefully give way to some highlight to some of these projects, you know. So mm -hmm. um, I also noticed, too, like if a, a, somebody has passed away, like doing a tribute interview with somebody that's uh, uh, related to them works. Like mm -hmm. having Alfred Hitchcock's granddaughter come on here, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, that was fantastic and doing a tribute to him. And uh, I highlighted the movie Ms. 45 because uh, Zoe Tamerlis Lund no longer with us. And twice I've had her her widow on here. Oh wow! And huh. and I got to hear all about what she was like, you know, and and um, and I did one for Ray Harryhausen as well in honor of the 35th anniversary of Clash of the Titans, and uh, and interviewed one of the trustees of his foundation that worked with him, and that of course led to an interview with Caroline Monroe, which was a lot of fun. So um, oh, I know Caroline. We did a show together in Germany, actually. It took me about five months to get that interview together, but I tell you, when I got her on the phone, it was just sweet music to my ears. Yeah, yeah, she's lovely. She was, it was a while ago in uh, Germany. It was when mad cow disease was happening in the UK and in uh, actually other countries too. Um, it was during that time, and we did this little show. I think it was in Münster, Germany. And we got to hang out together for the weekend. And, uh, yeah, she's beautiful. Just stunning, stunning, beautiful woman. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, had a, I talked to her. It was back at the very tail end of August. So I got mm. to the boat. It was almost a month ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked about the Golden Voyage. She said, Jackson, she still tells me, speaking of horror films, she tells, tells, excuse me, tell, tells me that Maniac is still banned there. Oh, my goodness. Heavens to Betsy. Oh, wow. Huh. Poor well, I know Nightmare on Elm Street, I think, is actually not allowed in China or something. I don't know. Anyway, or wasn't for a period of time. Anyway, I don't know. You know, it's weird because um, in 1971, it was A Clockwork Orange, Straw Dogs, and Dirty Harry that mm -hmm. faced a massive backlash and were banned. In fact, I think um, I think Straw Dogs is still banned in Russia, I think. I think, if mm. I remember correctly. Maybe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, wow. 30 years later in 2001, Freddie Got Fingered gets an R rating. How did that not get NC-17? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. I don't know. Judge Who them. understands what they... <laughs> I, I don't know how they judge it. I don't know what their point system is that adds up to, you know, an R rating or X rating or whatever. I have no idea. It's, it's so silly. But, you know, all of that censoring, ultimately, like you look at the TV industry now, uh, the networks were king, ABC, NBC, Fox, this, that, and the other. Well, and the censorship was really high. I mean, so it was so fascinating to see all the cable stations evolve from MTV to – and now AMC and the the content on these films and it's 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 R rated. It is such a different time now from when I started my career to what it is now, and the freedom of speech, as it were, or exposure, and how you know the Walking Dead and Game of Thrones and I mean the stories and and now of course the networks are finally getting on board with being a little, you know, not quite so squeaky clean, you know? So anyway, it's a very interesting phenomenon how the censorship ultimately was kind of the doom of, of the networks, you know, cause the audiences, they wanted to see more grit, more, you know, more exposure. And I don't just mean nudity, but language and like how people really live and how people really talk, you know? That, so. that was kind of the attitude of Seth Rogen when they did Sausage Party. They wanted to do an R-rated style Pixar, Pixar film. Oh wow, gosh! But then hmm. you then you get these people out there that um, I call them right wingers um, that lobby against these movies, and but then they want people to watch. They want they want to bring back the Hayes Code where you're not allowed to do this, this, and this. Basically, decide for everybody what they can watch. And they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll want garbage like fireproof 
to be the norm mm. movie, and I hate that movie. Sorry, but I do. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, but that was. I, I'm not a big fan of censorship. There comes a point, yes, where you got to censor some stuff, you know. But of course, there are children out there and and whatnot, and and yeah, of course, censorship has its purpose, definitely. But but for us adults, come on, really, <laughs> you know. Well, there's one group in Los Angeles that will remain nameless. I can't stand them. They review like I come from a Christian household, and I'm a mm -hmm. Christian. I read my Bible. I love the Passion mm -hmm. of the Christ, but I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you, um, I hate a lot of these faith-based movies that come out that this group in L.A., well, they review movies based on Christian uh, content, and um, mm. they'll give four stars to garbage like Fireproof. Mm. And uh, I noticed they're very, they, they blocked me on social media, and they blocked some <laughs> other... Yeah, yeah. Because, because they can't st they can't handle the truth. Mm-hmm, Yeah. Because yeah. I know full well, yeah. And, uh, Interesting. Yeah, but um, but they'll 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 push for family viewing. Well, I don't want children. Yeah. Can can I not go to the movies by myself? Like, uh, I know, right, right? I know. It's like go to if you want if you want children in your audience, go to a fabulous Disney film or something. You know, and of course we need G-rated films. Of course, of course, of course, and they're wonderful ones out there. Uh, but I, I, I'm actually rather pleased to see a turnaround happen with, um, with, uh, what you can see on your TV now. So yeah, it's good stuff. Amazing stuff out there. Gosh, I'm still catching up. And these same groups of people, they treat sex, for example, as a procreation tool. You, you, mean, right. <laughs> you mean to tell, like when you, when you're like me and you don't want children, you mean I'm not allowed to have sex because I don't want kids? <laughs> I know, right? That's like absurd. But so, hey, to each his own, right? To well, each his own. Just fine. You walk on that side of the street and I'll walk on my side of the street, you know? I always tell them to read the Song of Solomon, Solomon in the Bible because there's it's all about sex and there's not one mention of procreation. <laughs> well, there you go. And it's strange because I've only heard that book in the Bible preached once in my entire 44 years and I know really and I know yeah. and I know why because they mm. treat it like it's a dirty subject unless it's for procreation oh gosh well I was raised a Christian as well and I'm I'm not on that side of the street no way no I'm yeah interesting yeah but looking ahead at Dream Master here like um, Amanda Kruger you mentioned earlier um, I'm trying to pronounce the the last name of the act, Beatrice, uh, what was her, how do you pronounce her last name? I couldn't tell you right now. I don't know. Be oh, but Beatrice is a sweetheart. I can't, I can't, I thought it was people, people, peoples, peoples. Yeah, I got it written <laughs> down, I got it written down here. But <laughs> yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to um, pronounce it, but yes. Amanda Kruger. She, yes. came, she came to your rescue. Yes, she did. And that was quite a scene in the nun outfit. Too when I you see, uh, quote Amanda in the room with a thousand maniacs, and the door gets closed or a hundred maniacs, whatever. And that was so creepy to film to be in that nun habitat, and then all of these extras, all these men, including Robert England, you know, in this ragged, you know, costumes, and that was a huge set. It was giant. And they closed the door, and it was pretty freaky. It was really freaky to see all these hungry men staring at me, and whoa, it was it was wild. It was wild. Yeah, and you had uh, Whit Hartford, mm -hmm. Jacob. Yep. Any thoughts? Yep. Any thoughts? On what? On Whit Hartford. Um. Played Jacob. I, yeah, I know. Yeah, he, he went on to do a, have a nice career, I believe, right? Okay. You would know him more than I do, I guess. But uh, I don't remember what he went on to do, but I think he went on to do some some big stuff, I think. I, I, don't, I don't recall. Okay, and there's Kelly Jo Mister, played Yvonne. Yeah, absolutely. Kelly Jo um, and I ran into each other in the fashion industry. She started making what called Kelly K. Jo bags really beautiful leather handbag she sold to some amazing like a very uh famous store in los angeles called fred siegel okay that was one of her clients 
and she did some amazing work, you know, as well, like on uh, Mask. She plays the prostitute in Mask. Okay. She was phenomenal uh, and a lovely, lovely person. Yeah, we're still we're totally front buddies as well. Um, then you got Erica Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. Any memories of her? Uh, we never stayed in touch. Yeah, I, okay. I didn't stay in touch with so much from Nightmare 5. Uh, Danny Hassel, I stayed, we stayed in touch. Um, but Erica, she was actually a model. She was actually a model. Okay. And, um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. In fact, we dated the same guy at one time. Not at the same time, but <laughs> over the course, Brian Wimmer, who was in China Beach. Uh, Brian and I dated briefly, and then I, and then... Eric and he also dated. It's kind of funny. Gee, lucky guy. <laughs> mm, and, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> funny. And you got uh, Nicholas Meal. And, and uh, uh, I'd say his name right. Played- I, got, I haven't stayed in touch. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I no, nope. I'm just kind of rattling off some names here. Joe Seeley and Valerie Armstrong. Yeah, again, I, I didn't. I, haven't, I don't know what they're up to okay yeah no no problem well do, do you um what do you think of all these years later the the phenomenon that, that being part of this franchise oh gosh i feel incredibly grateful i had no idea you know almost 30 years later that it would still be such a big part of my life and i'm thrilled that it is i'm fascinated how it's uh, permeated pop culture all throughout the world, there's probably no place you can't go where they haven't heard of Nightmare on Elm Street or are familiar with Freddy Krueger. So, no, it's like a, this huge blessing in a way, and it's just it's thrilling. I'm, it, it's so fun at a show when a, a whole family comes up. You know, generations. We have grandma, we have mom, and we have the grandkids. You know, three generations standing before me that have all watched the Nightmare on Elm Street series. So it's it's really. Phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. Do you get recognized a lot? Oh, gosh, no. No, <laughs> no. Because I look so different. It, that's an interesting thing, too. In all the roles I've played, I mean, not not, not just Alice, but so many of the other play. I look different in every role. Uh, I had naturally, back then, natural blonde hair. They put a rinse on my hair for Alice and, you know, very little makeup and, and that kind of thing. So, you know... Uh, I, I get more like, you know, people go like, did I go to high school with you? Did I, <laughs> you know, um, but I look a lot different than um, how Alice was presented, you know, back then. So. Wow. Yeah. Because, yeah. Those films are coming up on their 30th anniversary coming up in just a few years. That would have been 88 and 89. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You, you could think how technology has changed back then. There was typewriters in school. Now most people today, <laughs> young people don't even know what a typewriter is. Uh-huh. I sure do. I was just on the tail end of the typewriter. I had a typewriter in college, but I know I think two years after me is when the computer, you know, the computer was definitely the way to go. Um, but I just missed it. So yeah, I sure know what a tape typewriter is. No doubt about it. And I'll take my computer over typewriter anytime. <laughs> Same here. Well, I was going to ask too, like, do you, um, you have a web page or anything you want to plug while you're on here? Oh, you're so sweet. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I actually have a couple films I'm going to be doing. Um, One of them is with Amanda Wiss, actually. It'll be in, uh, we're filming in New York. And then uh, another one called The Possessed, uh, which will be in Shreveport, Louisiana. And yeah, coming back to acting, all of that too is learning the social media aspect. And I'd had Facebook for quite a while and kind of did that, but now I do it a lot more and now I have very active on Twitter and I'm very active on uh, Instagram as well. Um, the be- best place to go is lisaewilcox.com. That's my website. You can you can click on the Facebook links, the Twitter links, the Instagram links. You can also see my actual acting reel that I use that's used for auditions. And also, there's a bunch of clips there from things I did like General Hospital and MacGyver, which, by the way, is having its uh, TV premiere this Friday. 
Okay. Uh, so it's a fun place to go. You see shots of me and, and this and that. Um, but again, you can reach all my social media by going to um, LisaEWilcox.com. Do you mind if I add you on Facebook? Go for it, please. Oh, send sure. it. Do it. Got, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'd love yeah, to. Yeah, so I so thank you so much. I mean, and I hope you all can check out the website and and uh, you know, I always appreciate the support. What's the film you're doing with Amanda? Are you allowed it's to talk called, about it? I can't talk about oh, it too okay. much yet. All right, that's okay. <laughs> but, that's okay. But it's on. It's on board. It's in. Uh, Tommy Huns- Hudson is also involved with the project as well. Oh so. wow! Well, yeah. that, that'll be fantastic. <laughs> now yeah. with you two in it, that would be that'll be great. You know. Well, yeah, we're hoping so. We're hoping so. So it's a really neat little project, a thriller. And I so got we'll to see. got to ask too. Do you got any charities or anything that you're involved in? <laughs> I haven't bought a cherry since Mark no, Hamill's no. house. No, I mean char- <laughs> charities. Oh, charities. charities. Um, I'm actually. <laughs> <laughs> I um. That's also on my website. Um, I'm a big supporter of NAMI, uh, the National Alliance for Mental Illness. That's um ca- under causes on my website, and we, just the stigma attached to mental illness is just horrendous, and just it's all about trying to beat the stigma. And also that mental illness is as serious as someone having diabetes and it's, it's, it's illnesses are treatable and, and all that. But the stigma against mental illness is, is, it's, it's slowly, slowly taking a turn. Uh, I'm also a big supporter of the Dachshund dog rescue or any kind of dog rescue. I myself fostered a, uh, decided to foster uh, dachshunds, this particular group. And of course the first one I fostered, I did adopt and he's alive and well. And, uh, so I'm, I'm all about, you know, fostering, adopting, uh, animals. But again, my website too, it's on there too. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned mental illness because, um, you remember, uh, when they had the, the, uh, ice bucket challenge a couple of years ago. I don't know that. The ice bucket challenge for ALS where people dumped ice water. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. After Robin Williams had passed away, um, there was, mm-hmm. uh, um, an organization called doubt Fireface uh, opened up and it oh, was really, oh. and it was for, su- for, uh, for suicide depression. Uh huh. And it involved, um, taking a pie in the face and nominating three people. Hmm. And I did one of those videos and, uh, I nominated people that I interviewed. Oh, neat. Yeah. And uh, one of my interviewees, Lisa Lang was, uh, accepted the challenge and she got over 500 hits in a week. Oh, wow. Wow. And I've had others that I've interviewed that that have accepted the challenge as well. In fact, um, somebody from Jason Lives has said that she wants to get together with the um, those uh, from the movie in L.A. and do like a group one. You know? Oh, I'm I'd be on board with that totally. Yeah, Yeah. I I was wondering. The awareness about mental illness is just like people are afraid of it, and it's like, no, guys, it's treatable. There's a course, a free course that NAMI teaches. If someone in your life, you know, family member, friend who is uh, has a mental illness, uh, about how to deal with it and how to help them and help yourself, um, because it's something that just can create such wreckage in a, in a family or in a relationship. But to understand it is the first step. You know, we we know so little about the brain. We know a lot more about our kidney than we do our brain. You know. And but again, it's slowly changing. NAMI is a fantastic organization, N A M I, and I encourage anyone out there listening to to check it out if you need help and you have a friend that needs help. But it's it's such a great support group for those around those that are mentally ill as well, because um, that's a toughie. It's a tough one. Oh, but you know what? That would be great. I know for the ALS challenge, the Ice Bucket Challenge, act brought in millions for that organization. So, okay, well, so, I'm going to have to. Cool. And I think with the doubt fire face, and you mentioned mental illness, they almost kind of go hand in hand. Absolutely. That's depression. Yeah. yeah. That's a, depression is a, a chemical imbalance, um, severe depression. So, And, you know, <clears throat> the hardest part with mental illness is the, the person with the mental illness is, and seeking help and getting the medications they need to, it's simply a, a, a chemical imbalance in the brain. 
But the hard part is to, you know, would you want to accept that like you're schizophrenic and you're going to take medicine for the rest of your life? However, once they do take the medicine or are compliant, that's the hard part is having them stay compliant on the medication. Um, that's the tough part. But uh, again, NAMI has this great course that uh, I learned so much. I learned so much. So, so, anyway. so, so where can they go to read more up on that? Um, N-A-M-I. Okay. Uh, it's NAMI. Uh, just Google NAMI and you can go to straight to their site and you'll see all the services that they, they offer a uh, fantastic organization and they're, they're known nationwide in the U S definitely. Perfect. Well, yeah, because um, when I, I did that challenge, one of my aims was if you get the industry involved, that was, mm-hmm. that is what makes it big. And, yes. And plus, you know, a pie in the face is fun to watch. So <laughs> That's right. So if uh, you're if you're up for that challenge, hit, shoot, bring, bring it on. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, for you, sure. You can nominate Amanda and Heather. Oh, there you go. Right on. There, <laughs> All right, I'll look into that. There you go. Well, I can send you details about it. You know, and but, okay, yeah, please do, please but, do. But yeah, because I know that people would view that and it would have a positive impact and i'm working on others and i've gotten a grid response from it uh, mm-hmm. most people most people have been very busy but i know that they'll do it i've had mm-hmm. one one that's done it but others that are going to but mm-hmm. um, somebody like you doing that and uh and of course you know like who doesn't want to see a pie in the face so all right well i would love if you could send me well what's the link I would just, there is a Facebook page to it, but um, it's, it's called Doubtfire Face, based on Mrs. Doubtfire. Remember Robin Williams put his face of, in the cake there? and Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah. So and, it's called Doubtfire. Yeah. Doubtfire. Doubtfire Face? Yep. I think it's okay. two, two words or something like that, Doubtfire Face. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's for, check it out. for suicide, depression. And I'll even send you the two uh, the links to two videos. Uh, one I did. Mine was like eight minutes long. Lisa's was 40 seconds. Hers was so perfect. Hers was... <laughs> please send me the links. I'd love to see it. Yeah, because uh, somebody like yourself, people that would impact people very, very positively. I'm so going to go and look into it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Now, before you go, I got only a couple things. Um, this is probably going to air out probably in November. And the reason why, because okay. I've got about, um, you're my 50th interview. I'm on once a week, and um, I just aired my 41st interview last <laughs> Sunday. So uh, okay, okay. So I've, I've got about nine ahead of you, but um, but when this is done, I'm going to send you the link, and you can post it wherever you want. Thank you. Yes. But it's only going to be on the server for the station here for limited time because of server mm-hmm. space. Then I'm going to be putting it in on my YouTube page, which will be sometime next year. Okay. Um, now, I was wondering if I had your permission, because I like to have pictures go along with the audio, if I could mm-hmm. use some headshots of you and whatnot to go with it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, just send me your email, I guess, through Messenger. Okay. Yeah, send me your email, and I'll, I'll shoot off some pictures to you. That would be perfect. And uh, yeah. right now I've got t- uh, 22 interviews up, and um, I'm putting one up a week, and they're getting a really good response. And uh, great, and it's been amazing. Yeah, I'll post it. Yeah. Oh no, it's been so fun. Yes, really yeah. great to get to know you. Oh, it's been wonderful, and I, and I, I really appreciate it. this. Is my first Skype interview, and I, I think it's recording fine. And nothing looks out of the ordinary. I would hate to okay. have to come back to you and say we got to do it again, but I, I think everything's working out. Uh, well, I appreciate you making the effort to do the Skype, and I think, um, yeah, because I have a terrible cell phone reception where I live, and it's so, uh, you know, I was doing an interview a couple weeks ago, and. The phone dropped the call four times. Okay, oh. it was terrible. So uh, anyway, so thanks for doing the Skype. I appreciate it. Well, I remember when I interviewed Uva Uva Bull. He he suggested it last year, and I was like, well, I'd never done Skype before, and we ended up doing it by phone, which was fine. But mm-hmm. I, I'm open to new things, and uh, you know, this is a yeah, new, yeah, it's a new opportunity. And you're my fiftieth, my first Elm Street, my first Skype. So you broke so many. <laughs> <laughs> It's a memorable interview. It's a memorable, memorable, memorable. (laughs) 
And uh, another thing, um, where could I go to get an autograph picture? Because you're so beautiful. Oh, I've got to get a picture I'll, of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll send you one. Just um, just send me your address. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, and, yeah, totally. Yeah, and one final thing, got to get a plug for my show. Yeah, got it. What do you want me to say? Just state your name and say you're listening to Greg Gilbert. That's, you know, my, my name and and. Uh, my show name is called Python's Paradise. You say you're listening to Greg Gilbert in on Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I'm just wearing it in Brunswick, Canada. <laughs> Little jingle. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, okay, here we go. Okay. You are listening to Greg Gilbert. Sorry, let me do that again. You are listening to Greg Gilbert at Python's Paradise in Brunswick, Canada. You didn't state your name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll do that again. Hi. Sorry. Hi, this is Lisa Wilcox from A Nightmare Elm Street 4 and 5 and other other things as well. Um, but I want you to know you are listening to Greg Gilbert at Python's Paradise in Brunswick, California. Let's have sit California. Do it again. <clears throat> Hi, you're listening to Lisa Wilcox of Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5, and you are listening to Greg Gilbert at Python's Paradise in Brunswick, Canada. There you go. You're not the first person to have to do it multiple times, but you know. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. Anyway, all right, well, thanks, Greg. So send me your email and, uh, and your address, okay? I will do that, and I'll add you on Facebook, you know. Okay, cool. That will be great. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, the blessing of your gorgeous presence. And <laughs> oh, thank you. When you see it, if you, you when you see Amanda Wiz, you tell her I said hello. I you bet I sure will. I'll yeah. be seeing her soon. <laughs> okay, well I I want to see that movie you two are in. I'm I'll have you two well, back. I'll have you two back on when that movie comes out to promote it. How's that? Yeah, that'd be great. That would be great. Thanks. Okay, well God bless you. God bless you. Okay, have a good night. All right.